want to talk to you today about how to wait well, how to wait well. You like to wait. I can tell you that I hate to wait. I'm a very impatient person and I got to wait for the first little, least little thing and a stoplight or whatever. And, and I'll say to my wife, you know what? I don't want this light to be red. I don't want this light to be red. I drive up to church every week and we drive through a border patrols checkpoint. And uh, sometimes there's a bit of a line up there and I'll turn over to my wife and I'll say, I don't like this long line. I don't like this long line. And I want to talk to you today about the Bible, what the Bible says. And uh, it's a message I need to hear about how to wait well. The Bible says, has a lot to say about this. Let's look at three verses real quick. Psalm 27, 14, wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. Psalm 33, 20, we wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently. Just don't wait, wait patiently for him. So we want to talk today about how to wait well. And our passage is Psalm 31, 9 through 14. I'm not sure if I'm following exactly uh, the verses that are assigned. And I will sometimes take a little bit of li liberty and move around a little bit. I think I'm uh, following just a few verses after the ones uh, uh, assigned. But uh, anyway, I hope that you will be gracious to me uh, with that. But here's our passage, Psalm 31. We're going to start in verse 9. Be merciful to me, Lord, for I am in distress my eyes grow weak with sorrow, my soul and my body with grief. My life is consumed by anguish and my years by groaning. And notice that word, my ears. And just by the way, I learned a new little PowerPoint thing. If you use the PowerPoints, you might check out the animation here where it actually draws that little circle. It's not going to show up on the video that, that way because I'm not smart enough to do it, do it on the video. But anyway, you might check that out on, on the PowerPoint. And he says, my years, I, can, I could deal with something for a day or two, maybe for a week or two. But he says, my years, by groaning, my strength fail because of my affliction and my bones grow weak. Because of all of my enemies, I am an utter contempt for, of my neighbors and an object of dread to those my, my closest friends. Those who see me on the streets flee from me. I am forgotten as though I were dead. I am forgotten. I have become like broken pottery. For I hear many whispering, terror on every side. They conspire against me and plot to take my life. But I trust in you, Lord. I say you are my God. And that's really our key idea that when we are called upon to wait, we want to say, I trust in you, Lord. You are my God. And here's our, our key verse I want to draw your attention to. Psalm 31, 15. My times are in your hands. Deliver me from the hands of my enemies, from those who pursue me. My times are in your hands. And here's observation number one. Our times are in God's hands. Your times are in God's hands. And the people that you teach this week, their times are in God's hands. Now, there's a couple of different theories as to when this was written. One, one is that it was written during when, when the period when David fled from his son uh, Absalom. But the other theory is that it was written during the 10 years when he was wandering around the de de desert fleeing from, from Saul. And I personally think it was written during that time. We don't know for sure. But this time surely il illustrates this idea that our times are in God's hands. And I'd like for us to summarize that. And I'll tell you up front, this is going to get a little bit boring. It's going to get a boring on purpose because it's going to give you the feeling of, of what it feels like to wait and year after year after year to go through the, the, the struggle. And I found a pretty good description. I searched on my vast uh, Logos Bible software library library for a, for a description, a summary description of this period of uh, time in David's life and couldn't found one. And our trusty friend, Wikipedia, uh, 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 found one it's online encyclopedia. And so I'm going to read a section from that. And if you're reading th this rather than just reading yourself, I would encourage you uh, maybe to put up some little cards. You could just print the PowerPoint slides. You do that uh, six up and then cut them up and give it, uh, pass those out, out to your people. You'll need to make sure you keep them in order. Uh, but, uh, but at any rate, and then uh, read just a little bit, maybe talk about it a little bit. What do you remember about this section and that? And discuss it to, to make it a little bit more uh, interactive. But, you know, because of video, I, I'll just be able to, to read it to you. And I'll make a few comments along the way. But we want to summarize this decade of uh, David's life and try to get in touch with what David meant when he, when he wrote, my times are in your hands. And what does it mean for us to realize that our times are in God's hands? Uh, so we start our summary this way. God is angered with Saul. We start back just before David in Saul's life. God is angered with Saul, uh, Israel's king, when, you know, when he unlawfully offers sacrifices and later disobeys a divine command, both to kill all of the Amalekites and to destroy their confiscated property. And you might ask your people, what do you remember about the story? And you may remember that Saul told David not uh, to destroy all of all of the property. And David said, I did it. I did destroy all that, that property. And Saul famously said, really? 
what is that? What, what, what is that? What is that neighing of sheep I hear in the background? And Saul said, oh, 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 I, I was going to sacrifice those sheep. I, I, I had a good purpose for keeping those sheep behind. And Saul famously said, do you remember to obey? Can you pl complete it? If people can complete it, it'll help to them to remember it. To obey is better than sacrifice. And uh, God is displeased with Saul. Let me keep reading the text here. Consequently, God sends the prophet Samuel to anoint a shepherd, David, the youngest son of Jesse of Beth Bethlehem, to be king instead. And once again, you might ask your people, what do you remember about this story? And you may remember that one son after another comes uh, forward. And uh, Saul said, nope, not him. Nope, not him. Not home. Nope, not him. Young, strong, handsome, 18 year years old, book. Uh, uh, buff and so on, but not him, not him, not him. And then finally, this scrawny little David, he's out uh, taking care of some sheep. He's not even, didn't, didn't, daddy didn't even think he'd, he needed to sh uh, show up, but uh, he is anointed a a as king. And uh, you see this when he is a, a young teenager, perhaps. He's given this vision for his life, that your life is going to be golden, David, that your life is going to be special, that you're going to do, God's going to do great things for your life. And maybe at 13 years old, he's anointed as, as king. And it looks like, you know, his life is going to be uh, really spe uh, special. And then war comes between Israel and the Philistines and the giant Goliath, uh, Goliath excuse me, challenges the Israelites to send out a champion to face him in a single combat. David, sent by his father to bring provisions to his brother serving in Saul's army, declare that he he can defeat Goliath, unbelievably. Uh, refusing the king's offer of the royal armor, he kills Goliath with his sling. Saul sets David over his army. All Israel loves David, but knows this next word, but. But his popularity calls Saul to fear him. What else can he wish but for the kingdom? And then some time passes, some time goes by. Saul plots his death. But Saul's son, Jonathan, was one of those who loved David, and he warns him of Saul's schemes, and David pleas. He goes first to Nob, where he is fed by the priest of Hamelech, and given Goliath's sword, and then to Gath and the Philistine city of, of Goliath, intending to seek re refuge with King Achish. We see his name appear several times in, in this passage. And the big idea here is, we want to see this over and over, some weeks go by, and then these weeks turn into months, and then these months turn, turn perhaps, we're not really sure exactly the timeline during here. We know it's about a decade altogether, but they're going to see this theme all through here, where I've inserted this, uh, the, the, these slides. Some weeks go by, and then some months go by, and then some years go by by. A key servants or officials question his loyalty, and David sees that he is in danger there. He goes next to the cave of Adullam, where his family join him, and then again, weeks go by, and then months go by, and years go by, and his times are in God's hand, and he's called upon to wait. From there, he goes to seek refuge with the king of Moab, but the prophet Gad advises him to leave, and he goes to the forest of Hereth, and then to Kaliah, where he is involved in fur further battle with the Phil Philistines. And then what happens? Weeks go by, then months and then years go, go by. Saul plans to besiege Kaliah so that he can capture David. So David leaves the city in order to protect the inhabitants. From there, he takes refuge in the mountainous wilderness of Zith. And again, some weeks go by, then months, and then years go by. Jonathan meets with David again and confirms his loyalty to David as the future king after the people of Ziph notify Saul that David is taking refuge in their territory. Saul seeks confirmation and plans to capture David in the wilderness of Moab but his attention is diverted by renewed Philistine invasion and David is able to secure some respite at En Gedi. Are you getting a little bit bored? I tell you, David was getting bored. David was getting weary at this time. And following God always involves a, a, a good deal of waiting as it did for uh, Paul. Uh, saw it. David in, the, in, this, in this case. And again, some weeks go by, some months go by, and then some years. Returning from battle in the, from the Philistines, Saul heads to En Gedi in pursuit of David and enters the cave where, as it happens, David and his supporters are hiding to attend to his needs. David realized he has an opportunity to kill Saul, but this is not his intention. He secretly cuts off a corner of Saul's robe, and when Saul has left the cage, he, he, cave, he comes to pay homage to Saul as the king and to demonstrate, using this piece of the robe, that he holds no malice toward Saul. The two are reconciled, and Saul recognizes recognizes David as successor, and perhaps David thinks the, the, the long ordeal is over. This long period of waiting is over, but it's not over. Some weeks go by, some months go by, some years go by. A similar passage occurs 
occurs in 1 Samuel 26, where David is able to infiltrate Saul's camp on the hill of Hakaliah and removes his spear and a jug of water from his side while he and his guards lie asleep. In this account, David is advised by Abishai that he is, has the opportunity to kill Saul, but David declines, saying he will not stretch out his hand against the Lord's anointed. Saul confesses that he has been wrong to pursue David, and he blesses them. And again, you may think, well, maybe David is thinking maybe this long ordeal is over, but it's not over. Some weeks go by, some months go by, and some years go by, some time goes by, and when you follow God, this is what's going to be involved. And following God often involves a good deal of waiting, and we need to learn to wait on the Lord. First Samuel 27, Saul uh, ceases to pursue David because David took refuge a second time with Achish, the Philistine king of Gath. Again, some weeks go by, some months go by, some years go by. Achish demonstra- permits David to reside in Ziglag, close to the border between Gath and Judea, where he leads raids against the Gerashites and the Gizarites uh, and the Amalekites and leads uh, Achish to believe he is attacking the Israelites in Judah, the Jermalites and, and, the, and the Kenites. Achish believes that David had become a loyal vassal, and he, but he never wins the trust of the princesses or lords of Gath. And at the request of Achish, instructs David to remain behind the guard in the camp when the Philistines march against Saul. And again, some weeks go by, some months go by, years passed. David returns to Ziglag. Jonathan and Saul are killed in battle. And David is finally anointed king over Judah. And I believe it is in this context that we re- he writes these words, my times are in your hands. My times are in your hands. Deliver me from the hands of my enemies from, and from those who pursue me. Observation number one, then our times are in God's hands. Observation number two, following God nearly always involves a generous amount of waiting. So we see a pattern in David's life and we want to ask the question, is this the normal pattern for people when they follow God? And is it what we can expect when we follow God? Will there be a, a generous amount of waiting? Well, let's look at a few examples. Look at the, the period of time in, in Noah. God waited 120 years after his instructions to Noah, but scholars believe that the construction project took a maximum of about 20, 75 years. So 50 years after he finished this ark, he's still waiting on God to bring the, the, the flood. We see it in the life of Abraham. Abraham was 100 years old when, he, when Isaac was born. He had waited 25 years for God to carry out his promise. This is what happens when we follow God. Abraham learned a lesson about the difference between God's timing and people's timings. He had said to to Abraham, I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I'll make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you and all peoples on earth All peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Did it ever happen? Well, in the news we saw just just recently, this is from September 16th. Uh, It's about a little less than a month ago for me. We read that Iran and the Palestinians lose out on the Abraham Accords. The Abraham Accords, as these four nations come together and they have lots of things that separate them. Our nation, Israel, and two of the Islamic states have lots of things that separate us. But as nations, we all point back to Abraham and all four of these nations say, you know what, we are in some sense followers of Abraham and we have been blessed by Abraham. And 4,000 years after God wrote these things to Abraham, God is still blessing all people through Abraham. This is the timeline on which God works, and we need to recognize this as we follow God. Hebrews 11, 13 says, all these people, I think including Abraham, all these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised in their life. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. What about Moses? Moses had to wait 80 years. You see, God's schedule is not the same as ours. Sometimes he waits so that he can do more for us than we expected. What about the life of Jesus? Even Jesus participates in the divine power of waiting. Jesus makes God's people wait 400 years after the last book of the Old Testament was penned before he comes. Once here, he makes them wait another 30 years before he begins his ministry. I'd wanted to start when I graduated from high school, but he waits till he's 30 years old. After the crucifixion, Jesus makes his disciple waits three days before the resurrection. Why not two days? Why not one day? After all, the disciples were soaking in grief and confusion during that time. And once Jesus returns to them, he promises to send the Holy Spirit, but not immediately. 
Do not leave Jerusalem, Jesus tells them, but wait, wait for the gift my father has promised. What about the Apostle Paul? The Apostle Paul also had several waiting periods in his ministry, which Bible students often overlook, but need to ponder. In his early ministry, Paul was sent to Tarsus by the brethren, Acts 9.30, and he did not come into the spotlight of public service again for seven or eight years. Later, Paul, Paul, a man of action, had to wait two years in prison in inactivity while Felix and Festus fiddled around in favor of the unbelieving Jews rather than to further the justice for Paul. And following God often involves a good deal of waiting. In fact, let's look at the people who didn't have to wait on God. And here's my list here, and you can see that it's blank. And it indicates to to us that following God often involves a generous amount of, of waiting. So here's our observation. Our times are in God's hands. Observation number two, following God nearly always involves a generous amount of waiting. In observation number three, while we are waiting, God is working. While we are waiting, God is working. Psalm 31, 14, but I trust in you, Lord. I say you are my God, and this is what we need to do when we are waiting. We need to say, God, I trust in you. You are my God. John Maxwell says, God prepares leaders, and I would say God prepares disciples. God prepares all his people in a slow cooker, not in a microwave oven. More important than the awaited goal is the work God does in us while we wait. Waiting deepens and matures us. It levels our perspective, and it broadens our understanding. And I close my teaching with, with a story from, from Charles Stanley. He tells about how his grandfather felt called to ministry, and then he had to wait and wait and wait and wait. And that story is in your PowerPoint. It's in the notes of the PowerPoint on the slide that has the, the, the picture for, for, from the book. Uh, it's a great book by Charles Stanley. You might want to read it in preparation. But may God richly bless you as you teach your people to wait on the Lord, because following God nearly always involves a good deal of waiting.